You know how it goes. If something is posted on the net and then this deluge of right hatred comes along and we imagine that there's a heap of people sitting there and who is then, it's, well, it's not a heap of guerrillas and, and they're not doing this without targeting. They are very targeted and Leah and the people from Reconquista Internet, for whom she is speaking tonight, have dealt with this intensely and they will tell you in detail. Hang on, start the movie because this is a recorded talk. Welcome to the talk behind the shitstorm, strategies and objectives of the new right. My name is Leah Richter and I'm here for Reconquista Internet report hatred. Before we get into the content, a few sentences about us. Reconquista Internet has been working for more reason in the net for two years. And since about one year, we are operating a platform to report criminally relevant, relevant hate speech, hasmelden.de, reporthatred.de. So we had about 50,000 reports and brought about 16,000 of them to criminal proceedings. And um, we can observe a certain dynamic of the exchange on the net and those that are decision makers don't quite know how to deal with this in a sovereign way and and the people that profit from that the most are the new right who have learned to use those dynamics for their purposes and find followers and spread their thinking and that's why we, we said we'd like to deal with the phenomenon and see what is behind it because we are mostly keeping to the surface, we see the shitstorm, we see the shitstorm, but we don't think about how these things are used in such a systematic way, what strategies are getting employed and, and what objectives are being pursued by the new right to spread their politics. And that's what we are trying to talk about today. I will briefly deal with who I actually mean when I say New Right Network. You could have three talks about this on, on its own, so I'll keep it short and then move over to the ideological foundation, to the strategy. If you're interested in that, you can read whole books on this, of course. The ideological foundation, uh, I have used as an example to see the worldview and, and see how the strategy is put together. You see the kind of thought leaders and that helps to uh, kind of understand uh, the whole thing better. The strategy that comes from that that's with certain objectives is going to be the main part. We will see how the new right intends to put implement their objectives and in the practical implementation will come to things that we may have seen in practice, which are the very concrete measures that are used to put this strategy, take it to the streets, as it were. And I would like to finish with what this means to us as users on the net and how we can deal with that. Now, who is the New Right Network? We are talking about a group that is very well connected and linked, that has a classic right-wing worldview. They want to portray themselves as an intellectual movement that has nothing in common with neo-Nazi movements from the 1990s. But in fact, it's just the form that's different. The content is the same. We have the same kind of thinking. We have the same worldview, the same aims. They are giving themselves an intellectual coating and like to be presented as hip and not as crude and not as thuggish as the neo-Nazis from the 1990s were seen because that as an image doesn't seem to work. They want to cover up this aspect, the fact that they have so much in common. And uh, they like to portray themselves as a kind of counter movement to this, 19, to this 68 establishment. They like to see themselves as rebels, as a resistance and so on. So that gives you PR points. You can uh, run a good communication strategy on that. And they like to see themselves as a large movement and like to want to be seen that way. But in fact, we have, we have a very small group here. Experts assume or estimate the number of active people to be about 3,000. That is something we should keep in mind. Uh, that is something we refer to during the talk. Of the course of the talk, the new right does everything it can to cover up this fact or to balance the disadvantages and the weaknesses that come from that. And they're quite desperate in trying to do that. 
Now, who belongs to this network? It's a manifold picture here. We have publishers, think tanks, we have right-wing NGOs that finance small projects, we have a lifestyle magazine, and we have the parliamentary wing, the AFD, Alternative für Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, which tries to set up certain distance between themselves and the new right network, but they are all very much linked and the AFD plays a very important role for these people. Uh, because all their uh, efforts in terms of human communication and discourse is supposed to bring the AFD into power. That is, the AFD is the designated parliamentary, the designated instrument to change the country for those people. So much about the network. As I said, you can take hours dealing with that, but we want to get on to the ideological foundations and what is done with that today. Now, as an example, I've brought a few thought leaders along that are supposed to uh, make this clearer. And that's interesting because the world view that comes from that influences the scene and, and strengthens their activities and their strategies. And if we know these thought leaders, then it's easier for us to understand the activities and what is happening because lots of the activities relate to us and and involve us and try to make us to manipulate us into certain actions and when we realize that and understand what's being done then we can decide whether we want to play along so let's move to the first thought leaders we'll start with historical people i've brought along carl schmidt he was a constitutional law expert he was an active follower of the Nazi regime. He was fascinated by the Mussolini dictatorship in, in Italy, and he was an anti-Semite. And the main impulses he brought along, which I found important for today, was that he saw politics in a friend or foe kind of way. And so he had an us and them thinking, established this kind of thinking. And in the next step also, he became quite intense, describing what kind of society he dreamt of. And he dreamt of a homogeneous society. Society, uh, you should be more or less equal within one society, and that contained explicitly contained and the expulsion and and uh, eradication of the other. So the way he described other ethnic groups or people, he was quite blunt, and it gets quite clear what the inspiration what inspiration this is for current thinking schmidt believed on a struggle for survival between the people and i would say that he was the foundation for the new rights politics and other understanding of politics of the new right the next person is armin mola born in 1920 he was a published publicizer and and, and writer he was he belittled or denied the holocaust he understood he supported the republicana new right party in the 1980s, 1990s. So you see the kind of corner that he's coming from. And his main impulse is, is the thinking that the current way the, the society is ruled is a left kind, left wing kind of thinking. So the right is are the rebels, a sexy kind of um, group, the rebels that which they use these days, of course, in communication. And from 1950, he uh, used the term of the conservative revolution and coined that term. He wanted to revive the um, nationalist rights quite soon after the Second World War. He's seen as the founding father of the new right and he's an active a supporter of De Benoist, whom we come to later, and Kubitschek will be in, in the slide after this. So Alain de Benoist, he also was a writer, born in 1943, he still is alive, and he has an anti-egalitarian kind of thinking, and he has, the, he's, he, he really influenced the, he took over the cultural hegemony concept from Gramsci's and uh, uh, Gramsci and uh, says that political power can be attained by influencing discourse. And also, Alan de Benoist uh, had thinking that it would be a good thing to uh, communicate political contents in a, in a covered up way, in a <clears throat> disguised way. 
and he formed the term of the new right and he used the term of ethno pluralism as well a term that is an intellectual disguise for the old thinking of aliens out foreigners out it's a term ethno pluralism is a term that we meet quite a lot these days he's one of the most important q prompters um for the right-wing people these days. Renaud Camus, a, an author, supported Front National in France. He was convicted for inc incitement to violence, and he coined the uh, conspiracy theory of the Great re Replacement, or the White Replacement, a very widespread theory that you probably have heard about. Um, this is played up and down in, in, in the scene, and it's being inserted into discourse, and it was used by many uh, uh, attackers, uh, for example, in Christchurch and El Paso, and we'll come to that a bit more as well. The last two that I brought along, one for one, Götz Kubitschek, a publisher and writer, born in 1970, very much networked in the scene, a prominent role. He is an advisor to the AFD, he gives impulses, and his most important impulses I would regard as the thinking that metapolitics can be systematically used to attain power, provocation can be used as a communication strategy and it's recommended and described how to do it. And it's also interesting that he uh, uh, had a kind of precursor to the identitarian movement, um, the conservative subversive action, uh, which he founded with activists uh, uh, to, to gain attention through activism. And Martin Zellner, born in 1989, he is a co-leader of the right extreme identitarian movement in Austria, and his main impulses are several measures that I brought along. This is the MO war and the info war. There's an activist approach that he takes to gain attention and uh, playing with media attention. He's the young face of the movement, the poster boy. He gives tactical impulses and he communicates a huge amount, blog posts, an interview here, uh, talks with right-wing influences there. Um, he has a huge platform in the scene. And I was talking about a few central concepts earlier on, and four of these I would like to deal with in a bit more detail. The first is ethno-pluralism. Uh, short, in short, this is nothing else but the statement that foreigners should get get out from the 1990s, but that's not wanted. Uh, I have said that they want to appear as a, not having anything to do with this kind of thing, that to be more much more cultivated and intellectual than these people. Uh, from the 90s, so you have the same kind of concepts because the thinking is the same, the worldview, but you need different terms. So they try they try on a new term, ethnopluralism, and impose that on the old concept and hope that people will not notice. Ethnopluralism is described as or means that, uh, that the right wing people say that ethnic groups cannot really live together in peace. So everyone please should go to their own country and stay there. Uh, and that in a perfidious way is, this, is explained that yes, it would be to the best of everyone. So they act as if the other people's well-being would be at the heart, but it's just about their own group as always. And this is driven to the top by saying, okay, we're not just against migration, but one also wants re-migration and that gets us straight back to foreigners out. So everyone that is not does not fit the picture should be thrown out, and that of course should make clear what kind of thinking this is. Now the great exchange, the great replacement, rather, is a very relevant conspiracy theory. It's kind of based on ethno pluralism because this uh, comes, this starts from the. Uh, the premise that people cannot get along, ethnic groups cannot get along very well, so there must be a problem if one ethnic group comes and joins the other. So migration movements are interpreted as an invasion, and the other then is the enemy who attacks me, and that justifies for me a defense. So what's happening here is a reversion of perpetrator and victim, victim and a, a justification for violence that sounds very drastic to come from a linguistic phenomenon and, and then come to violence. But that is exactly where we come from the word to the deed, where stories like this are told massive, especially in the digital, digital discourse, people are told massively, if you attack migrants, if you attack refugees, you're just defending your fatherland, right? And 
And this, these declarations really are happening when people do make attacks against refugees or supposed refugees. When the, the people ask, "How why did you why did you do this?" Many of these people reply, "I just wanted to defend my fatherland because these people want to do this and that here." So. This is a highly dangerous, highly toxic narrative that really leads to violence. And it is massively played into the discourse. It is spread widely. And people are not stopping after certain right-wing attacks, terrorist attacks that we have seen. That is a very important aspect of this narrative. The other two concepts uh, deal with power and communication more, cultural hegemony, I've talked about it. That is a concept of a left-wing thinker, Antonio Gramsci, that was taken over by the new right. And this says that if I want to attain power and redesign society, I first have to influence people's minds. I have to influence attitudes of the people, get them over to my side before I can then create political facts from that. And the means of choice is the discourse, so society, social debate, what we are talking about, what is supposed, what is right, what is not, what should we do next, and so on. And that is what is happening. And uh, currently, it's mostly the digital discourse, because that is where the systematic weaknesses of the scene can be covered up, as we said, that they, the fact that they are a small minority. The strategy is called metapolitics, and we'll come to that, how exactly that is supposed to work. The conservative revolution is actually was created as a different term than it is used than the way it is used today. It's used in the way that people say, well, come on, we are in a very evil left-wing establishment surroundings. So we are the rebels and we are the resistance and that's how they sell themselves. And both these terms in the word in, in the double term conservative revolution are problematic and the one thing is that people are selling themselves as the great rebels as uh, uh, because they want to gain sympathy from the audience and the conservative part of it is a disguise because if the right wing people sell themselves as conservatives they do that because they can link get in um, link up with people that if, if they were open and say how intensive their thinking is and show and, and as 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 enemies of humanity as anti-democrats as ready to be violent then people will run away they will not find followers thankfully so they sell themselves as conservative as worried as critical as people that can still think on their own you know these kinds of terms and that is why we should not accept such kind of self-definitions. A right extreme person is not just conservative. These people are trying to put on a sheep's clothing to find a platform that they would normally be excluded from. So that was a very fast-paced journey. Um, I do not intend to be have given a complete overview in terms of the people or in terms of what these people have said. It's about an exemplary insight into the foundations of thinking of these, this scene. What that, who do they refer to? What kind of thinking do they identify with? And if you sort this into three columns that you can get, we have the foundations in terms of the content, in terms of the message. It's the us against them. Uh, it's the uh, homogeneous society that is sought, uh, which fits ethnopluralism very well. And on that, built on that, the great replacement conspiracy theory, which is an instruction set to justify violence, as I said. Now, strategic thinking includes uh, communicative, uh, communicative approach, approaches, cultural hegemony, conservative revolution, the way I define myself as a right-wing movement, provocation as a communication strategy to balance out one's own weaknesses and 
the kind of um, gradual, insidious way of communicating one's political contents. And when we come to implementation, you get terms such as info war and email war. Haven't explained those yet. We'll come to that. These are the, me the measures where these things manifest themselves. Metapolitics is a kind of summary and the activist approach um, to gain attention in the media. Now the question is, what does the network do with these foundations? We've seen the quotes that the thought leaders are seen as the foundation for activist approaches. So what do these people actually want to achieve and how do, do they want to get there? And that's quite interesting because the aim sounds very crude because they really want overthrow, they want revolution. You can perhaps not really imagine that, but the fantasy is for the end of the state as it is at the moment, the end of democratic institutions. In any case, the free and democratic foundation of our society, uh, they, they wish for the end of that. And in any case, the expulsion of all non-German people, the closure of borders, the end of um, opinion pluralism, everything that's a disturbance because someone is different and has a different opinion should be eliminated. And then that's because they want, don't, don't or can't don't want to or can't deal with that. Um, violent fantasies are being uh, spread far and wide. You may have heard about networks where very explicitly people are fantasizing about mass murder, um, they, people that are practicing shooting and all that. And, and all these fantasies are very, very far, uh, very widespread. And the whole scene, I should repeat, hopes that the AFD, the Alternative for Deutschland, Alternative for Germany, uh, for Germany should uh, become successful, successful and get into government and, and reshape the country in the way that the right-wing scene imagines the country to be. As crass as this sounds, the scene does formulate this in such a crass way. A quote from Götz Kubitschek who says that very explicitly, our aim is not to get involved in discourse but to end a consensus, not to, to uh, have a place in the salon but to end the party. Now that should end. Uh, that should tell us. That should tell us what they, where they want to get, where these people want to get, and and how they will develop if we just let them get on with it. Now that is an actual objective: the end of the state as it is, and the creation of a right-wing state. And now let's see how they intend to get there. The topic is. Well, we're still talking about a light minor minority, um, and that makes it hard to get a kind of connection. To, so they have to find out how they can actually attain power, and, and, and the internet comes into play here, and that's why we're talking about a digital tactic, because the internet offers more ways of, of gaining influence than there, than there used to be before, and how exactly this looks, we will look at the term of metapolitics, I have used it a couple of times already. The idea is this, we have a minority that wants to attain power, but they are not being listened to, they're not interested, and they have an extreme opinion, a kind of anti-human opinion, so that, that's make, that makes it difficult for them. Uh, so this minority has the option of influencing social discourse and has to be, uh, implement certain tricks for that employ certain tricks. And if they manage that, then a right-wing discourse dominance is achieved. That's their thinking. So if the discourse is permeated by right-wing narratives and ideas, then there is a normalization and a lack of taboo. Um, and that removes certain thresholds for people to deal with these kinds of thinking and approach it. And if these thresholds, if, if these barriers were, are removed, then perhaps people will vote for the appropriate party. That then, of course, is attain, attainment of power. And so when that is reached, is the idea, then they could become come into government and really change the country in the sense of a right extreme objective. That is the kind of thinking, and that gets it from the communicative behavior of a minority in the digital discourse to a political change in the whole country. That is what they try and why, why they are playing metapolitics up and down and, and use this as their central strategy. Now, how does this look? 
We now get to things that you may have seen. We now leave the underwater kind of level and come to the tip of the iceberg, as it were, where these things become visible, what can be seen. It's quite easy to see uh, with three uh, issues. The first weakness is that the right-wing network is a minority and they have do not get a lot of attention for that reason. They want to compensate for that. And they use controlled provocation to compensate for that. On the right, we have a few examples that you may know. These are examples that the new right have communicated themselves or where content have been readily taken over and, and, and spread further. So what is done um, in controlled provocation? You use the current dynamics of the media age and supply exactly what the media will be interested in, what the public will interested, be interested in, because it provokes uh, fear and, and outrage, and that will, is something we will deal with on social media. So how can you just transgress borders and publish polarizing content that is just a few steps beyond what is acceptable, so everyone will talk about it, and those that publish it will gain a lot of reach, no matter whether it's negative or not. If you see this, you see it, and potentially a new follower or supporter will be gained. It will at least increase the perception, the prominence of the person. So if I do this, first uh, aim is media, atten media attention. And the second is where we come in as users. Because if I see what happens on Twitter, very, very often, uh, for example, with the Javier Nadu video, uh, people said, oh, this is so terrible. I'm going to comment on that. And I'll show all my followers how terrible this is. So you uh, retweet something and comment, and uh, your whole bubble is then supplied with that content again. And that is something that these people aim for. That is what controlled provocation wants to achieve, because they know that these kinds of reactions will uh, come, and that will get them more attention. So that is the second level. So what happens if this attention has been gained? Content that no one would otherwise have looked at uh, faces, contents, organizations, ideas, concepts, narratives are spread and reach people that have, would never have seen them in the first place. And the self-image will then be taken over and accepted without critical thinking. And what comes from that is that people can deal with this or think about it and maybe become uh, followers or even donors. Uh, the thinking is spread, of course, so that is what's happening on the outside and on the inside. It, these actions, if, if, they, if they are successful, uh, they strengthen support within the scene and strengthen their own thinking, so it's us against them, so us uh, will then become stronger in that way and, and get closer together. Um, there's often a dog whistling, so messages that the normal society uh, find ambiguous, but that the own group clearly understands as right-wing extreme. An example here is um, the uh, quote that the Nazi regime was just a birdshit in German history. It's very easy to say this and then later deny, oh, no, no, you misunderstood me completely. Uh, and of course, the right wing scene understood completely, perfectly well what, how this was meant. So the support has been reached. And at the moment I've posted this or said this, I've gained the attention. Then, of course, against society, I am in danger of, of losing image, so I have to backpedal, and that gets us to the third level of gaining attention. Of course, that gets me into a position where I can say, well, if you invite me into this talk show for another hour, I will readily explain how I meant this from my own framework and why I'm actually the good one. So again, I'm, I will reach another platform. So three levels of attention through one um, provocation. That's why this is used in a systematic way and why it also works, because we are until now playing along nicely. And it would be good if, if that could change. The next level, the next weakness is that the groups are radical and that is a problem for their growth. And we've um, already heard that the right wing 
the scene tries to cover up the intensity of their thinking because they know that they will not gain any connection that way. If they come out openly with their Nazi thinking, that would very be very hard to, to grow, but they do want to grow. They are not so many they to, to, to actually achieve much. So they cover up their thinking. So they, their, their problems of growth are... Are trying, they try to compensate by using the emo war, and we'll see what that actually is. Emo war means that there is a competition through emotion, not through facts. If you reach people from the on the emotional level, then someone who tries to under, uh, to, to um, convince these people by facts will have a very hard time to to work against the emotion, and that is quite easily seen in the way how general the arguments are. There are not many facts, and there's a lot of outrage involved, a lot of wrath, and that's the level that we are talking about. These contents are supposed to uh, remove emotional barriers and find um, and create identification figures, and a counterculture sometimes is created. We're talking about examples of cooking shows with right-wing symbols in them. Uh, supposedly cute Instagram photos where people play with animals and uh, in a way that is hardly noticeable. These children are wearing the, uh, the right-wing symbols or we have certain rappers, so we come to the counterculture here. The counterculture is relevant because they try to, for all aspects of our cultural world that, that we know that we deal with, uh, they try to create another offer and, and say, this is our right-wing offer. Wouldn't that be interesting to you? Uh, uh, relevant to what, what has been known already. And, and of course, they create a certain cultural space that is set up in a way that everyone in the scene can, without any problems, uh, remain in a sphere that is right being dominated and, and has less contact with the outside world and has less danger of, of being questioned and perhaps questioning themselves. That is the perfidious aspect of it and that in social media is, is very easy to do. We've seen examples, uh, you've seen some Instagram and YouTube, I've, you see some Instagram and YouTube pictures and this invitation to empathy is the uh, worst enemy uh, a quote. So, right-wing influences are a good example. As already known, the influencer module, this, this focuses on people that appear as they could be my friends, uh, that look like they come from real life, that are approachable, that may communicate with direct messages. So, they communicate a certain closeness and try to get me build up a bond with them and on that basis political contents are being communicated because if I have if I'm already thinking that this is a great person that I will listen when these people talk about politics even if the concepts become weirder and weirder and so that emotional barrier is not easily dissolved and that is a challenge interesting also is how important this influencer model is regarded uh, the co-leader of the Identitarian Movement of Austria, Patrick Leonard, said, Metapolitics is the, consists of building up new influences and convince established influences to ultimately move the social climate towards one's own ideas. So there's a lot of expectation connected to this strategy. Uh, to slowly, uh, with a low threshold, uh, spread right-wing thinking and, and insert it into pop culture, basically. And finally, uh, the right-wing, of course, has the problem that, the social, that society has a different opinion. We still are dealing with a radical minority, so there's a problem of that. That is a problem then to influence a society that is decidedly of a different opinion. And the next topic then would be the info war. And uh, you've seen a very good talk about this um, before. Um, the talk, let's play info war. So I'm not going to go into detail here, but just for completeness, I, was, I wanted to insert, uh, include this. So the new right sees itself as being in an info war about the um, dominance in the digital discourse. So they are using hate speech and fake news, alternative sources for that. 
And there are whole networks that are dealing with this from a political motivation. We have an example uh, from the Reconquista Germanica server that officially has dissolved itself once the German interior secret service was on their toes, but there are other networks and also you could question whether these people really have stopped their activities or or maybe they have just massively gone into the AFD and into supporting that party. So they are inserting their ideas massively into the digital, digital discourse. They are using memes, um, videos. They are using non-serious news sources, fake news, uh, basically. And these uh, find a fertile ground where the New Right movement uh, is working on uh, portray the serious press as the lying press to undermine the authority in this course. Because if I, as a network, uh, do things that are really anti-humanist, and if I, if I then um, act in that way, then press reports will be a problem. So I will attack the press now and. Uh, what is created in that way is a vacuum in people's minds that say, oh, come on, maybe there are no objective facts anymore, nothing that we can believe in. If you can't believe these, who can you believe in? So the message is, you don't have to believe these people, but believe me with my blog. I'll explain the world to you. It happens to be right wing. Uh, or you dissolve the belief in, uh, in in actual truth and uh, you can then kind of communicate more or less everything that's what's behind this and that's why this is becoming so uh, widespread and and then hate speech of course is a direct influence of the discourse because many people if, if you use sock puppet accounts and 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 really flood the comments and uh, then you displace other people from the discourse and those that remain are those that are using hate speech to put it very simply so we are dealing with a movement that uh, with a, a development where moderate people are withdrawing and and the aggressive people are taking over and 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 political opinions and, and views can be normalized in that way and barriers are removed and others may then get involved and and the sort of hardening of people that is transported that way uh, normalizes this kind of thinking and kind of prepares the ground to perhaps uh, implement that normalization in the voting booth as well so the illusion of an of a majority opinion is then created that perhaps silent readers will find attractive in some way because if i think that everyone around me has a certain opinion then that will influence me in my own opinion as well we know that 77% of hate speech, uh, as registered by the German Interior Ministry, comes from the right. So this is being instrumentalized, and uh, although we have more right extreme violent attacks and terrorist attacks, we've had them. At least now it should be clear that this is at least accepted or perhaps even desired. So we'll come to the uh, conclusion, what does that mean to us? We've talked about five weaknesses, more or less, of the right-wing network. We know that it is a loud minority that tries to look larger than it actually is. We know that the thinking is the same as old Nazis and new Nazis had. It's just repackaged because they know that the old ways didn't quite work so well. And the manipulation of discourse is the central strategy to attain concrete political power and shaping power. It's not just talk. It's not just a discourse on the Internet. This plays a very large role. It's also important to see that the AFD is seen as, uh, as a, playing an active role as the parliamentary wing of the scene that should create facts in society and reshape society according to right-wing ideas. And very important to us, the digital strategy of the new right will only work if we all play along. And that is the important point, because all these measures that I've introduced that I've talked about, they really depend on us all playing the role that they are wanting us to play. And that, of course, gets us into a very comfortable position to just get out of the game 
uh, that they want us to play along with, because at that point, the game is over. Now, a few suggestions for that. We shouldn't ignore hate speech. We should report digital hate speech and digital crimes, and we should support the victims. Uh, if we have provocation, we should take care not to fall into the trap. This is a learning process. It's a manifold thing. But we should really, every one of us individually should, should strive for that. We should look at street zones critically and, and check them for plausibility. Um, see, um, there was a video. Um, uh, <laughs> I'll skip that German example. We should recognize uh, anti-human content and dis uh, debunk it and oppose it. And we should have knowledge about manipulation technologies and share it. This is a central point because the interesting thing about manipulation is if we notice that someone tries to manipulate us to do something, normally, automatically, we will fall into a kind of resistance. So we see that if someone tries to stubbornly sell us something, then normally we want the opposite and we would not have this person have their way. We can use that. If we inform people that we are getting manipulated, that, are, that people are trying to manipulate us and which direction this is supposed to take, that we are supposed to become part of a right-wing thinking and a violent thinking, then let's tell the people that and get out of that game. And that's what I would wish for. And for that, I would say, like to say thanks, and I'm interested in your questions. Hello. Okay, I'll go into the pad and wait for your sign. Okay. Okay, I'll start, Leah. Please. Yeah, no problem. Yeah. Yeah. Hello. That was a very. That was a very tough talk to listen to at points. Um, of course, we know all this, but if you see all this concisely and, and summarize and all that, then it kind of, that is something, it really, it, it, it gives you the frights. And first question, Leah, you do hear me? Yes. Is this all a specifically German strategy, or can you can this be found in other countries, or is it even internationally agreed upon? Well, in short, it's not specifically German. It is. Uh, you can assume that mainly in the U.S. sphere, this was started when the uh, troll culture that was normally originally not political linked up with. Uh, uh, the, the old right Gamergate was a very important point there. So that's when they started to, in the right wing spectrum, to, when they started to notice that the mechanisms of the digital discourse could be used and instrumentalized for their own purposes. So this was not decidedly not a German phenomenon. Uh, there's a lot of connection internationally and uh, people are using role models from other countries. Next question. Behind me, I have the interpreter with a lot of delays. Sorry, Andre. Would you, the connection between the new right and the AFD, would you compare that to with the organization of the identitarian movement? Uh, uh, for the IRA. Uh, I think the comparison with the IRA is a very strong comparison. That was an explicit terror organization. Maybe that is a bit too strong of a contrast. The AFD does seem to take care to keep the disguise on and keep it strong. We know that their right-wing movement, the so-called wing, is under observation from the secret services, and they're changing the language, and they know that they're treading the boundaries here, and 
I wouldn't compare the AFD with the IRA. They do try hard to uh, use democratic means to, to attain power to shape things, but what then is supposed to come from that is not so democratic anymore. Next question, is provocation a, a means instrument of the left? Yes, you can say that. You could say that the new right explicitly looked at uh, what other uh, successful groups did that did, and then they are using these uh, uh, groups that they've seen as left and using what they've seen as successful, the identitarian movement, what they do, for example, is clearly inspired by Greenpeace, for example, um, taking over the concept of cultural hegemony uh, that was from a left thinker. So the concept and the strategy from the left is uh, used and enriched with one's own thinking. So language is reversed. The talk of the establishment being the left now, for example, uh, the left-wing fascism, fascism that is talked about. So the, they are using what is seen as successful and turning it, it around and they're seeing it as a huge challenge to, to deal with that. Okay, um, someone deleted the questions in the pad all at once. I can remember one. Is Jan Böhmermann off topic? Uh, is Jan Böhmermann still connected and engaged with you? We are independent. Uh, I didn't say this. Reconquista Internet, the organization for which I am here, was founded in a TV program by Jan Böhmermann. That's why this question is asked quite a lot. We are independent by now. We are in contact, but he is not responsible for anything that we do. Have there been media psychological studies and which ones to found the term of the emo war in a scientific way? I am not aware of any such studies. We took, we, we took up the term because the co-leader of the identitarian movement, Martin Zerner, is, is using this term and, and describing it, his, his activities in that way. I haven't, I'm not aware of any studies. Um, I believe that uh, this is coming on gradually. Society slowly is noticing that there is a problem and then the studies come along as well. So maybe that there will be a scientific base later on. <laughs> and I was t picking up on this because the right is talking about it in the same term, using the same term. And uh, so that leads to the next question. Sorry. <clears throat> How not at all. <laughs> How is it, can a democratic and digital discourse possible with the right? That's an interesting question. Um, we had a book a few years ago speaking with the right, and there was a lot of debate, and there was a lot of debate in this pad as well. I would say that there are there's a graduation and the, of intensity of, of this worldview. Um, there are people that I won't reach if they have a certain closed worldview. And I would have to invest such a lot of energy with such a low probability of actually reaching them. So I wouldn't recommend that. But we're not talking about a black and white spectrum here. There is a category of worried citizens in between people that maybe are leaning towards a certain sympathy for these views or that may be caught on with some of these strategies that we talked about. So these are people where I would say it, it would be worth to engage in conversation with, with them. And there is a spectrum. And in the gray areas, I would say, yes, of course, get, into, get in touch. I wouldn't recommend everyone just to withdraw in their own bubble. We've seen a few years ago that people said, well, if someone says this and that on Facebook, I'll delete them and just go away. But then these people are still moving on in their own bubble and then we can further exchange is taking place and I cannot offer my, my alternatives and that may get them to think. So I would distinguish between depending on who I am dealing with and do I expect them to still listen to me and it's just the establishment of a conversation, the fulfillment of a tactic maybe. Um, so that's not always easy to 
to understand. Yeah, and we'll slowly come to the end because we'll need some time to switch. Uh, so, but a, a very interesting question, and I've given my own opinion as well. Uh, and uh, how have we come to the fact that we, and I believe that we have a consensus that AFD and, and others are scum that should be deplored, although what mainly joins us is that we do something with computers. And that's interesting. And it's just in Germany and Austria, I think, where the IT bubble is so much left wing. It's not the case in the Netherlands or in, in the US. Leah, but I don't know if you can answer that question so well. Uh, I think the question is why this talk will be uh, part, becomes part of this program here. And uh, I cannot say that just by giving the talk, I know that everyone is agreeing with me. But I think it fits the program very well because in the wider sense this is an IT topic and because uh, political topics, certain IT things, social media in the wider sense and our use of it are being used to create certain political facts. And I have to add to that that in the Vienna CCC there is a declaration of non-compatibility between left, uh, between right-wing views and membership in the Vienna CCC. That's quite an achievement, I would say. And as far as I can see, the CCC in uh, was founded, the German CC was founded in the rooms of the left-wing political, uh, left-wing paper Tageszeit, or Tats daily paper. Um, last question, because it's five minutes before ten already. Have you been able to research um, how the case of the Umweltsau video was organized? Um, that was a video a very strong, strongly satirical video on climate change that was far criticized. And yes, and that was an occasion for us to really look how, what, how is this, this uproar organized? And um, there were two different, different teams of data analysts that came to the same conclusion, one from the Spiegel newspaper and the other, uh, don't let me guess, uh, it would, you can try and research it. So two, two teams looked at it and it reached very few people at first. Um, and then certain accounts in the right wing areas spread this. And uh, there are hints that uh, actually uh, people paid for more reach on these, this uproar against a kind of crude video on environmentalism. And this was then magnified. And I did mention this uh, in my talk, uh, we would wish for such phenomena if if they are being used to enforce certain change of opinion, for example, change the behavior of, of public broadcasting, then we cannot assume anymore that there is a huge wave of, of uproar. Uh, so I have done something wrong and I have to backpedal that kind of thinking that happened in, in the public broadcaster that, that was affected by the shitstorm. Um, of course, it's uh, very easy to, to get shocked and then jump into some action, and that is the wrong thing, because if we then notice that this was not an authentic uh, depiction of outrage or authentic reflection of outrage, and if a public broadcaster then kind of falls onto its knees and uh, and uh, uh, caves into a right-wing media phenomenon, a shitstorm, then these people, of course, will be triumphant and say, oh, fantastic, this huge public broadcaster has caved in. Um, and there have been protests and, and threats for murder and all that. So that is completely out of proportion. And I would really plead that we should be careful and the speed at, at which we interpret shitstorms and derive actions from that is sometimes wrong. We should not that should not have been uh, decisive on, on on that public broadcaster's actions, and we should learn from that. Okay, with that, I have to finish. Unfortunately, we have two minutes left to the next talk. So thank you. Uh, a virtual, a huge virtual pause. Uh, we, you were great, and uh, you've had a lot of positive feedback in the pad. Uh, so thanks.